We're going to get started today. We're going to talk about a program we call View from the Street, the first 20 minutes. So what does that have to do with? Well, we're going to talk about what we consider the three most common occurrences and instances that occur during the first 20 minutes of an operation. We'll go through some of the standards that we throw out there, some incidents that occurred, why they occurred, talk about what we want to look at, what we want to size up, how we want to pass the information out to the chief officer in the street. We'll progress through this program. We have a couple of videos we want you to watch, and we're going to have an, an interactive program today. We're going to ask you what you think about the video, give us some feedback, what are the things you pick out, what are some of the nuances you pick up. So we're going to try and engage you as we go through the next hour and a half. Uh, Rich Blattis, Tom Richardson, what are some of the things that can go wrong in a fire in the first 20 minutes? Anybody? Shout them out. Water problems. Is that a problem? Major problem. Major problem. So we're going to get into that a little later on. What else? Manpower. Okay. How many people here are career firefighters? How many are volunteers? Okay, a lot. Okay. And now those of you that are career, how's your staffing? Some are good, some are bad. We come from New York, we're very spoiled, even though they just took one away from us recently from our engine company, we're still pretty flush in manpower. How's, uh, how's our staffing on that picture up there? <laughs> we got enough? <laughs> How many you get on a first alarm? About 50. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to point out that that picture that he's referring to is Bladis burning down half a block in, in the Bronx. So, We'll talk about that later, too, so we we'll, won't we'll worry about it. So manpower it is a problem, right? If we don't have enough people to do stuff at a fire, we're going to lose. And you'll hear me say this afternoon, we're either winning or we're losing. Would you say that that's pretty accurate at a fire? In, in the first 20 minutes in particular, either we're winning or we're losing. And we have to make decisions based on whether we're winning or we're losing. What else happens? What else can happen in the first 20 minutes? Okay, Maydays, we're going to talk about Maydays. We say collapse, we're going to talk about collapse. You guys hit on two of the most important ones that we're going to hit on uh, as we go through our presentation. So, how about locating the fire? Can that be a problem in the beginning of an operation? Does it present us a problem? And why is that a problem? Ah, whatever we do with the fire depends on where the fire is. Would you agree? If we don't find the fire, we cannot continue, or continue effectively or safely. Good. How does experience factor into our personnel? We talk about number of personnel. What about the experience level of our personnel? Who went to the, the live burn, our hands-on class? Anybody come out? We did a couple of Mayday scenarios in there. Do you think experience of the firefighter impacted on those Mayday scenarios? Yeah, it does. It impacts how you react under pressure. It impacts how you're going to implement your training. You know from yourself, when you were a two-year, a three-year, a five-year firefighter, things you were taught, you impl implement them differently than when you're a 20 and a 30-year firefighter. So we're going to talk about a little bit about experience also. So we'll move on to the first slide <clears throat> and how things, what happens in the fire ground in the first 20 minutes. This slide's been around a, long, a little while. You might have seen it before. <laughs> right? And that's a result of being inattentive, sorry about that, right? Help you up, okay? I think that happened at our hands-on training the other day, didn't it? I think it did happen. It did, unfortunately. All right, so be attentive to the tasks that you're implementing, all right? Keep track of what you're doing. All right, so we talk about the normal flow of information. Now get yourself in the first 20 minute mindset, okay? From the receipt of the alarm to you arrive on the scene, we're gonna talk about the normal flow of information from the officer or firefighter, how it's gonna paint the picture. Now think about it, you get a run, you're in your house at home, you get something over the page, you're in the firehouse, you get a run. You know, first two, 2300 Webster Avenue, three-story occupied MD. You're going to start to paint the picture in your mind of what's going on. What am I going to see when, I'm going to, when I get there? What resources do I have in the box? How much manpower? How many firefighters do I have coming? Do I have any difficulties, things that are going to impact on our operation? Hands-on training the last two days, did something impact on our operation? It was 103 degrees outside. It absolutely impacted on our operation. Not only during every, every exercise, when the firefighters came out of that building, they were totally spent, but how all the training evolved throughout the day. So we're going to try to paint the picture of what's going on as we start to arrive at the scene and respond. What do you teach your, your, uh, 
your officers? Do you have formal training for your officers upon promotion or when they get elected in a volunteer department? Every vo I'm, I'm, I've been a volunteer for 34 years, so I know how it varies across the spectrum. Many times it's a popularity contest. In the career side, many times we take exams, so we have to study for promotion. But once a person becomes an officer, a first line or a front line officer, what kind of training do you provide them? In the volunteer system, do you require them to have certain uh, levels of training? Some places are very good, some are not. So the officers are the key to success on the fire ground. So if we don't provide them training at the various promotional levels, um, they're going to be inept, they're going to be inexperienced at the least, and maybe make some unsafe decisions. Well, we come from New York and the career side. We have one of the most progressive training programs for pump promotion. When a guy gets promoted from firefighter to lieutenant, four weeks, of, five weeks now, five weeks of school, they come offline, they go to school for five solid weeks. When they get promoted to captain, they get another three weeks of training to be captains. When they become a battalion chief now, it's eight weeks of training. Rich and I teach in that training program, believe me, it's long. Eight weeks of solid training to the battalion chief level, and when you get promoted to deputy chief, it's two more weeks of training. Tremendous amount of training. We had, I think, four weeks when we got promoted to battalion chief, and a little less, we didn't have any training as captains in, in about four weeks when we were lieutenants. So think about that in your departments. The volunteer side, make sure or try in your departments to have requirements, some kind of minimum standard to hold your officers accountable. We have NFPA standards, 1,021 for fire officer, various levels. Do you require guys to at least meet some of those standards? Very important. And try to group that training together. Again, we're talking about the first 20 minutes this afternoon. How it ties into all these points we're putting up on the screen. We talked about the flow of information. Now talk about, we mentioned location of the fire, water supply, et cetera. Get into the mindset of how these points, location of the fire, the intensity of fire, possibilities for extension, how this is all tying into the first 20 minutes of the fire. What's going on prior to your arrival? We talk about in a lot of the fire service publications, you know, it's to receive the alarm, how long to get there, the reflex time. We talk about 20 minutes for collapse. We could throw all these numbers out there. Think about all these things as you're responding. If you're coming from home, if you're getting to the firehouse, it's a lightweight construction building. You know it from your drills and your training. You know the location. By the time you get there, you're 20 minutes into the fire. You're going to have to make some pretty difficult decisions as the first arriving officer, what you're going to do and how it's going to impact on your operation. And what if you're unable to obtain the information you need? What if it's inaccurate? What if it's incomplete? What are you going to do to get it? Let's talk about being a company officer a minute. You're the first one that arrives on the scene. You send out the troops. You want to gather information. You want to know what's going on. You want to size up. What if the information coming back to you doesn't jive with what you're seeing with your own two eyes? Does that happen? It happens all the time. Yeah, we got it. We knocked down the fire. Well, no, you didn't. Right? We think the building is sound. No, it's not. What about, what are you going to do? You're the incident commander. You're the first arriving officer. You're the lieutenant for the day. You got there first. You're going to make the operational decisions. What if there's something going on you don't like or you don't agree with? What are some of your options? Just throw them out there. Investigate further. How might you do that? Send another crew in. Send a different set of eyes in. Okay. What about another, uh, an officer that comes up to you if you're familiar? Do me a favor. Take a walk around the back. You know, this is what I'm getting, but it doesn't look right. Right? Assign divisions, divide it up. Keep reaching out to get the information. Use your resources on the scene. Again, in the first 20 minutes, these are the key operational decisions. You're going to set the foundation for the rest of the operation. And we know from building construction, if the foundation's bad, the building's bad. So we're going to set our operational standard high, early, and we're going to continue throughout. So these are some of the things we're going to talk about this afternoon. These are what we're going to key in on, because these are things that are major problems for us in the first 20 minutes or before at fire operations. We're going to key in on flashover, talk a little bit about backdraft, mostly about flashover, how do we prevent it, some of the preventive measures. We're going to talk about building collapse, what to do, what, how, how it happens, what should we be looking for, and then how are we going to handle when a collapse happens and we have firefighters in trouble. And then we're going to key in on communication difficulties. We're going to have you listen to some audio tapes of a couple of fires, listening to firefighters give May Days, and we're going to ask you to interpret that and tell us what you learned, what did you hear, how can we handle it, and how to manage a May Day. You guys, there's classes out there how to manage May Days.
and we're going to get into that a little bit. We're going to show a couple of video clips. We want you to look at the, uh, the video clips coming up shortly and, and get these, these points in your mind. See what you're gathering off the video clips and see if you made any operational decisions you know, differently than you see on the screen. But what are some of the industry standards to tie into what we're talking about? Communications, collapse, backdraft, okay? We all talk about construction in Vinnie Dunn's book, in Brannigan's book, okay? 10 to 15 minutes, lightweight steel truss fails. 15 to 20 minutes of work time is in an SCBA. So how does this line up? 10 to 15 minutes from the start of the fire. When do you get there? Usually it's longer than 10 to 15 minutes. Now you have 20 minutes operational time. So you're already behind the eight ball on some of these structures before you even arrive on the scene. So we want you to get that mindset going, get that in your thought process. How many of you use 30-minute cylinders in your SCBAs, 30-minute bottles, okay? Is that an accurate statement for a 30-minute bottle? What, what would be more accurate for a 30-minute cylinder? 10, to 10 minutes, 11 minutes, around that neighborhood, depending on what kind of shape you're in and all of that, what kind of work you're doing. That 15 to 20 minute now, many of us are wearing 45-minute cylinders. And that's a little bit more accurate for the 45-minute cylinders. However, the, the bigger bottles, we have a little longer to operate. Remember now, we're all wearing bunker gear. We have all this equipment on. 20 minutes working in 100-degree heat is a long time. And you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. We saw it in the last couple of days doing hands-on training. We were out there in 95, 100-degree heat the last couple of days out in Baltimore County Training Center, and we had some difficulties. Some of the firefighters had some difficulties although much was self-inflicted from prior night's work, if you know what I mean, <laughs> all right? So we tried to get them to identify themselves early in the day. Just admit it because we're gonna find out sooner or later. We're gonna know uh, when, when you come out of the building and you're very sick or so, you know, or you're going away in an ambulance, so. But 15 to 20 minutes with the 45 minutes cylinders. But what Rich is talking about is that you have to have in your mind, when you get through one cylinder out of fire, particularly in hot weather, most guys are done. We gotta have reinforcements. We talked about manpower a little bit before. Somebody mentioned manpower. If we don't have reinforcements to do things, when firefighters get tired, we're gonna be in trouble. And the 15 to 20 minute mark, that's when you gotta make the decision as the incident commander, are we winning or are we losing? What are we doing here? There was a fire uh, yesterday, I received it on my, on my Blackberry. There was a fire at a sewage treatment plant in New York City on the Upper West Side. And I was just talking to one of the lieutenants in the back, Joe Connolly from SOC. There was a fourth alarm fire. I said to Joe, how big was the fire? He goes, it really wasn't that much. But it was 100 plus degrees. It was a long haul with the equipment. So fourth alarm fire for us is probably about 150, 200 firefighters in that range. Guys. So think about the personnel, the large commitment of personnel for something that's really not that big of a deal. And then think about your own town in this weather if you have an operation and how much of resources you're going to need. Or even if you can begin an operation. Maybe you can't. Maybe you can. We did a class in Cooperstown once, and it was a really older firefighter in the class. I think he was 80 years old, been in the fire service like 50-something years. And I asked him, I said, tonight, it was snowing, it was hailing. I said, if you had a fire tonight in your town, and you needed mutual aid, how long would it take to get there? He said, tonight, in the snow, man, an hour. So, an hour. Now, can they start an operation with the half a dozen firefighters? Eh, probably not. Probably not. So factor that into your thought process. Talking about response times, how long it's going to take to get there, okay? These are the NFPA standards. We just throw them up there for informational pur purposes and how it relates to your town. Okay, in an urban area, more than 1,000 people per square mile, nine minutes is an acceptable response time, and it goes down to the remote area travel. Greater than eight miles. That's a pretty phenomenal thought, right? Especially for us on the east, east coast and the northeast, that help would come from greater than eight miles away. That's a tremendous distance. That's like halfway to New York, right? Eight miles. Right? So think about your help coming from 10 miles away and how long it would take. Right? That's something to really dwell on. So on this slide here, the who, what, and where, if you had to look at the information on that slide and you had to pick, they're all important. If you had to pick what was the most important piece of information or the, the most important words on that slide relative to being successful at a fire. What would you pick? Water. Who likes water? Raise your hand. Anybody have something else? Mutual aid, some people are saying. Okay, why do you say that? Say again? Mutual aid. Maybe because you don't have enough people initially, so you gotta rely on the mutual aid, I guess. All right, 
Did anybody say where? I'm a, I'm a where believer, quite frankly. Now, what, water is good. But before we put the wet stuff on the red stuff, as they say, we have to know where the fire is. The location of the fire is paramount. You have to find the fire. Okay? You've read probably several, if you follow NIOSH reports or you just do some reading in the trade magazines, very, very often firefighters get into trouble just trying to locate the fire. Okay? So we got to locate the fire and get water as quickly as possible. So that's my view. I don't know if anybody may agree or disagree, but that's kind of what I think. I agree, of course. Where, where, if you read the NIOSH reports, there's pre-control, the control phase, and post-control. If you think about line of duty deaths, where did the incidents seem to occur the most? Right? Pre and post. When we're putting water on a fire, things go better, right? If things go better. It's our searches to find the fire, and what's coming up quickly in the fire service is floor lofts, the uh, lightweight construction in the floor, and you'll notice that in the last probably year and a half, a lot of firefighters are falling through into the basement, okay, because we're going to find the location of the fire, and it's below us, and it's eating right through that floor because the type of construction. So that's the up-and-coming thing in the fire service, okay? And post control. Now, post control is when we tend to get careless. Why do we get careless? Because we think we have it. It's over. It's over, so we're, we're, we're kind of stepping down, you know, we're starting to take our face piece off, the fire's knocked down, it's when the toxic gases are the highest, it's when the building is most apt to fail, it's already been weakened and now it's been settling for a while. We get killed in churches in post control, the uh, steeple came down a few years ago, a tragedy in Pennsylvania, buildings collapse in the post control, we get careless in the post control, we walk through holes, etc. So those two phases are most dangerous to us. Do we have the info to need, we need to get the job done? Okay, when we're making these decisions, we have what we need. We, we hit on a lot of these points, but just to review. The water supply, the info to the incident commander from the interior, and I can't stress this enough. If you're the incident commander outside and it doesn't make sense to you, don't make a decision. Get more information. Verify what you think is going on. If an officer tells you something and it doesn't jive to you, it doesn't jive. Okay, you have to be in your comfort zone. Don't let the information push you out of your comfort zone. If you're standing out in front of that building and you're saying this isn't going well, but the people on the inside are telling you it's going well, but everything you see indicates it's not, the smoke, the building's leaning, you're hearing things you don't like, don't let, don't let the information push you out of your comfort zone, okay? Get better information or pull everybody out and start over. Rich, Rich talks about comfort zone. How do you determine, or how do we all determine, what is our comfort zone? How do you figure that out? Right, can, can you describe it? Okay. I, what's that? Buddy sense. Say again? Okay, yeah. Right. How do I feel, you know, at this particular moment? How much experience do I have? How many fires have I been to? How many times have I seen this scenario? Okay. Comfort zone is very uh, complex term, believe it or not. But everybody in this room has a different comfort zone, you know, depending on where you come from, what type of activity you do most, and how many fires you've been to. Even within your department, people are going to have different levels of comfort. In our department, because we're so large, and because every borough in the city is different, you know, we go, we banter back and forth about Brooklyn, the Bronx, Staten Island, et cetera. But it comes down to your comfort zone. You know, I worked in the Bronx, big H buildings, lots of taxpayers. That's my, that's my foundation. That's where I come from. Tom was in Brooklyn. Smaller buildings, commercial buildings, brownstones, row frames, things I didn't have. So all comfort zones are different. Same thing with Chiefs in Manhattan. Jay Jonas spent a tremendous amount of time in Manhattan. Jay's very comfortable in loft buildings, 50, 100 story buildings. We're not that comfortable and we didn't do that often. So even within your department, you'll have different levels of comfort that will impact on your operational decisions. Okay, again, the points the, we hit. Sorry, Tom. Just that last bullet I just want to talk about for a minute or so. Do you think or do you believe that instinct plays a part in firefighter behavior, fire officer behavior, chief officer behavior, right? I absolutely agree with that. Now, I worked with some very experienced firefighters over the course of my career. Those that were my, some, some of those, my most respected mentors. And some of these people, you know, if, you, if you've been to a fire with these guys or gals, you know. They always go the right way. They always make the right move. 
I went right, they went left, they found the victim. I went left, they went right, they found a the fire. There are people that just literally sometimes have a sixth sense in fire operations. It comes over time and experience. But I absolutely believe instinct. Have you heard a saying, Chief, why'd you pull those guys out of the building? And then a minute later, the building collapsed. Just didn't feel right. Just didn't look right. Instinct plays a part. Believe it or not, you're gathering a slideshow of information over your course of your career. So that's where the instinct comes in. It's very important. It's a very important part of firefighting, I believe. Does training impact on your instinct? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You train hard. You, you put all your effort into your training. It's going to impact on your instinct because the things you learn in training are going to impact on your thought process and help you when it doesn't feel right, it doesn't look right. So it shows you, again, how important training is. Flashover facts. We're going to start talking about flashover a little bit. The number one bullet point we said on things that go wrong in the first 20 minutes. So I wanted to review a few things from Vinny Dunn about flashover, okay? You probably read the book. It's still very valuable information. Occurs early in the fire, five to ten minutes from the receipt of the alarm. Now think about that. This book was written in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Five to ten minutes from the receipt of the alarm. What's changed, let's say it's 30 years. What changed in the last 30 years? Building construction, window type, right? What we're using, how that impacts. So relate that fact to today. What don't you see anymore, at least what we don't see too much in the city anymore, in fires? When you pull up, right? Back in the day, we pulled up, the fire was almost always blowing out the window. Almost always. If you take any fire service book from the 70s and 80s, that's all you see, these great pictures. Fire here, fire there. What do you see now? Heavy smoke pushing under pressure. You don't see fire out the windows anymore. How come? Right? Thermopane windows, hurricane windows, four panes of glass, whatever they put in between there. Very tight now. Very tight now. So what happens now when we take the window? Boom, right? Flashover, backdraft, whatever phenomenon occurs. Back in the day when this was written, flashover occurred earlier than it occurs now. Okay, so flashover occurs, occurs later now, and we get there the same amount of time. So we're on the scene now when flashover occurs, for the most part. That's what you're reading about. You know, when we go to our first Firefighter 1 training, we learn about the stages of fire, right, and the chemistry of fire. We learn there's the incipient stage, there's the growth stage, there's the fully developed stage, and there's the decay stage. Well, we learn that in Firefighter 1. So those of us, those of us that have been around for a long time, we kind of almost forget to pay attention to the stages of a fire. Like Rich said, we don't have many fires anymore that are at that fully developed stage, you know, where the fire is ripping out the windows. Not a lot, not a lot of those anymore. However, it's important that we recognize what we're crawling into and what stage of the fire are we in. Aside from that, what's the initiating event for a flashover? What causes flashover? It's heat buildup, right? It's when everything in the room reaches its ignition temperature and the entire room ignites. And we start to see in what they call rollover. We see little tongues of fire. Those of you that have been in a flashover can, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you, unfortunately, if you were in a flashover personally, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of work and studies being done today. We used to equate the heat buildup with flashover and lack of air or lack of oxygen to backdraft, right? So now there's a lot of work being done at the National Institute of Safety uh, of Standards and Technology. There's some guys from New York City Fire that are working with some of the engineers and the scientists. What we're finding out now, and this is all in the beginning stages, and it's something that it's going to change the way we do business. Ventilation is actually impacting heavily on fire behavior. It always has, but now we actually are talking about ventilation openings, opening a door, opening a window, ventilating a window, impacting on flashover occurring now. We never talked about that before. So you get the opportunity and you go on NIST's website, National Institute of Standards and Technology, they're doing some interesting work relative to ventilation and how it's impacting on the fire ground more and more and that we might have to change the way we ventilate, okay? So that's, a, that's a, just a piece of information I wanted to throw out there. I sat in on a presentation for chief officers in my job most recently and I was stunned because I have 31 years on the fire department and I never heard some of this stuff. It was very, very interesting. So if you get a chance, take a look. If you see these presentations, it makes you a believer. 
you really have to see it and, and watch the test results and say, wow. And you got to remember how things have evolved, like we talked about, the windows, et cetera. So flashover is being delayed. Now we're coming in with bunker gear. So we want you to use these facts to piece this together, right? So flashover is being delayed. We're coming in with bunker gear. OK, are we entering the structures quicker? Sure we are. We got all these great tools today, right? We got rabbit tools. We got hydraulic tools. So the days when Tom and I came on a job or our out of vent firefighter came in and opened the door for you, came through the apartment, usually crawled past the fire, found the victim sometime, came to the front door, opened the door for us because we were there with an accident at Halliday, not really getting anywhere fast. Now you have a hydraulic tool. So you pop for that door right away, you're going in. OK, so we have high heat beat buildup. The windows are holding. We're all bunkered down. We get in there quicker. And what happens? We just came through the door, like Tom said. Right? We just opened the door now. Where's that fire going to go in a hurry? Right at you. Right at you. So we have to tactically evaluate how we're operating now. Yes, sir? We're also getting in further into the gear. Absolutely. And it's not a shoulder you don't go to. They have a better hood that makes you feel less and it's more insulating and better gloves, et cetera. Absolutely, we're getting in further faster. <clears throat> So the buildup of heat is aided by more efficient construction, okay? We have tight buildings, tight windows, et cetera. <clears throat> and a Vinnie Dunn fact, the firefighter equipment bunker gear travels two and a half feet per second. You have about two seconds to exit. Is that still valid? So, what, about, what about the 16 firefighters that are in front of you? Yeah. So he says the five-foot rule. If you're more than five feet from the exit and it flashes over, you're in trouble. That's good for the first guy. You know what I mean? What about the guys behind him? You know, big problem, big problem. So just think about that. Now let, let's just talk about PPE for a second, okay? How many of you went to the opening ceremonies? A lot, okay. So firefighter Pete DeMontro got up on the stage, got the uh, firefighter firehouse heroism award, one of them. Uh, he is in my battalion, uh, ladder 132. That's a Brooklyn battalion, I just want to make that clear. He's from the Bronx, okay? That's a Brooklyn battalion that got the James Gordon Bennett Medal, highest medal of honor, okay? I just want to make it clear, all right? So Chief Kilduff talked about what he did very quickly, but let me, let me talk to you a little bit about, uh, about a little more. I was not working that night, I was not at the fire. One of my fellow chiefs was. And what he did that night, if you ever go to, have you, anybody ever see the video on YouTube on that fire? If you, if you, uh, Put in Putnam Avenue Fire on, on YouTube. Putnam Avenue Fire, P-U-T-N-A-M. There's a video from a cell phone from a woman across the street from the fire building. She, she didn't catch the entire thing, but you kind of see the firefighter and the civilian that he came out with on fire. And they're putting them out with a hose line from the street. But needless to say that what Chief Kilduff mentioned this morning was he literally is the poster child for the proper way to wear your protective equipment. He had everything on the way it was supposed to be worn. Hood, helmet, chin strap, everything. Everything was on properly. And he did a tremendous job. But unsung to that, and I just wanted to talk about it a little bit, we talk about water. We talk about how important water is and how important experience is and making decisions in those first initial minutes of a fire. Well, I'm an old engine company guy. And I always like to give a plug to the engine if I can. He's a truck guy, so we'll get there later. <laughs> but the first new engine company at this fire, what they did at that fire had a direct impact on saving Pete's life and the civilian that came out on that uh, area ladder on fire. The first new engine company came into the block, and in New York, we do our primary way of stretching hoses, what we call a backstretch where the pumper pulls in front of the building, they pull the hose off, and then they drive down to a hydrant. Well, at this particular fire, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. They pulled into the block, and it was fire coming out the windows. They knew they had a really good job. There was a hydrant right across the street from the fire building, right across the street. The chauffeur of the, the engine company, young guy, wasn't a regular chauffeur. He was kind of a backup chauffeur. Not a lot of time on the job. He saw the hydrant. It was between two parked cars. It was available. It was accessible. He made a decision, split second. There's people jumping, there was people jumping out the windows, fires coming out the windows, all kinds of mayhem going on. He says, I'm not going to take that hydrant. I'm going to go to the next one. And the reason why he did that, if he would have taken the hydrant the way he would have had to position the apparatus, he would have blocked out both ladder companies. They wouldn't have been able to get to the front of the building. So he made a decision, I'm going to the next hydrant. 
Number one, excellent decision. Number two, that engine company is a, is a really good engine company, and they decided to drop a second hose line. They dropped two inch and three quarter lines before the rig went to the hydrant. That second hose line was the hose line in the street that actually put them out when they came out on fire. Two excellent decisions. The ladder company apparatus was able to get in front of the building, both rigs, nose to nose. Both had their aerial ladders up. They were able to get a civilian out of the window before Pete climbed up and then went in and got the other guy in the back of the building. But tremendous operation all around, and that was just my plug for the engine guys. Go engine. You know, Tom mentioned we teach the Chief's Command course, and the coordinator, the course coordinator is Jimmy Bossa, the guy we got promoted with. And at the end of the course, we get all the instructors together to do a one-day recap. And Jimmy mentioned in the last class, he goes, you know, I just realized there's six instructors, five of them from Brooklyn, and one guy from the Bronx, a little poor guy from the Bronx. So I stood up and said, yeah, it always did take five of you Brooklyn guys to take on one of us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to show a, <laughs> a quick video on flashover. This actually occurred in 11 minutes. Look at the video, watch what's going on. I want to show that one more time. What are you, what are you seeing on the video? What's happening? Aside from the chief stretching the hand line, <laughs> what's going on in that video? What caused that? Popping the windows, a little premature ventilation, okay? You saw the fire was out the rear window on the two side or the B side, okay? And they, they obviously didn't have water back there yet. They were taking the windows a little early and caused that event to occur, right? Took the front windows too, yeah. If you want to talk about the air. Uh, how, how you guys feel about the air horn? Blowing the air horn and get guys out of the building. I'm, in this day, me personally, I'm not a big fan of that, and I'll tell you why. More and more departments now, many firefighters have radios. If I'm the incident commander and I'm in front of that building, and they're blasting on the air horns to get guys out of the building, I can't hear the radio. So if guys giving a mayday, guys are trying to get information to me, or I'm trying to get information to firefighters in the building, I, I have a, I, I don't, that whole system was designed I think, personally, many years ago when we didn't have a lot of radios. It was a way to communicate, okay? So I'm not a big fan on the air horns. I just kind of wanted to bring that out. So a second quick video on flashover. Again, this occurred about well the 16-minute mark. It's filled with highly flammable solvents. The firefighters call for backup and try their best to bring the flames under control. What happens next takes everyone by surprise. The force of the explosion is immense. You like the guy with the hands? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's two different videos on flashover. What's the difference between the two videos? What's like really evident in the first video aside from the ventilation that's not so evident in the second video? The smoke, right? The first video is an obvious bad situation. We got visible fire, the smoke doesn't look too good and we vent. The second one, the fire is deep into the building, okay, and they're not getting a lot of information outside, but they're continuing to operate, aside from the ill-trained firefighters, let's call them, that are standing on the sidewalk with absolutely no gear at all on, uh, and it flashes over. So just to illustrate that, it's, always, it's not always going to be obvious when you have that flash over. It could be buried in a building. It could be, it could be a room like this where the fire is all the way in the back. So you have to get the information from the inside and really take an account of what's going on.
So what are some preventative measures for flashover? Again, we're talking about the first 20 minutes. Okay, of course, ventilation, stream, stream to cool the superheated gases. There's a class out there, one of our colleagues, the Art of Reading Smoke, great class. They talk about cooling the gases from the outside. It's, it's another different concept. It's new to the fire service, but has anybody read that or, or looked at that stuff? Yes, yeah, shaking their heads, yes, okay. It's, it, the theory is that if you cool, as the smoke is coming out, all those superheated gases are coming out. If you cool them on the outside, they're not going to hit the correct temperature to ignite and ignite back into the building. So it's just a different scientific concept that they're talking about. But so now, cool, cooling the gases was always an option. For what us. I was saying before now, we're in, a, we're in a bit of a bind now because we're saying here ventilation can be preventative for flashover. But what I said before now, some of these studies that are being done, that might go against what, we're, what we always used to think. So just keep that in mind. It's, things are always evolving. Firefighting is a science. And it takes time to learn new things. It takes time for us to change our culture. Um, as far as cooling superheated gases, what, how many of us were taught, how many of you were taught, do not open the line on smoke? <coughs> Never open the line on smoke. You don't open that line until you see fire, you see the glow, right? Well, today, if we do that, this gentleman said we're getting in there faster, we're getting in there further with our bunker gear, we're getting into trouble that way. We have to be mindful that we may have to use the hose line to cool the upper areas of the building to cool the superheated gases to prevent flashover. How many of you have been in the flashover can? A lot. So you see it in the flashover can. You're in the flashover can, you start to see the rollover, they do the penciling, right? They cool it a little bit and it stops the flashover from occurring. That's exactly what we're talking about here. All right, so a um, little contrary to what we've always been taught for those of us that have been around a while. And what's our preferred way to ventilate structures? Vertical, vertical ventilation, right? And today's budgetary fiscal constraints impact on our personnel. Vertical ventilation might not always be possible, right? So that's another, another factor that we've thrown out there that you have to think about. Okay, searching in an organized and effective manner. And this goes along to, again, what the brother in the front said, that we're gonna get in there quicker. Okay, how are we gonna search? Our department's in the process of rewriting our search bulletin. We used to vent for life and vent for fire. That concept's gonna go out the window because along with what Tom said, you know, we used to, I don't even wanna reinforce what we used to do. We used to do things differently. Uh, it's gonna change. It's gonna change how we vent. It's gonna change how we operate at the fires and that's gonna tie into what we do when we search. All right, if you've been around for a long time, we used to go in the front door, we'd vent as we go, right? We'd take a window, we'd search. We'd take a window, we'd search. The idea of we're giving that victim a chance for survival by taking those windows. That's gonna change. As technology changes, we have to change. Okay, things are gonna change with the way we vent. And our training, of course. Knowing our buildings, and again, Tom Keat on the location of the fire, knowing where the fire is, what's going on. Knowing where the exits are, the construction, the interior layouts. Think of how the, all these things factor into how you operate today. All right, a firefighter with bunker gears, uh, bunker gears 150 pounds, 150 pounds with your SCBA, Think about how you're gonna operate, how long it's gonna take you, the stresses that are gonna be on your body, and how you're gonna methodically search this building and get out in a hurry. Do we search residential buildings differently than we search a large area commercial building? What's the difference? What's that? Okay, many times in a large area commercial building or an industrial building, the life hazard is life hazards a lot less. We maybe should be a little less aggressive. What else about the building features? It changes the way we search. Right, the simple size. So our search patterns are different. And when it comes to getting yourself out of trouble or getting yourself out of the building if you get into a flashover situation, when we're searching a residential building, we typically use the walls as our reference. We do right-hand lead, left-hand lead. We do, if we did a good size up, we know where the windows are. If we pass a window, I just pass the window. I pass the door, I just pass the door. We have reference points. When we go to large area buildings, with much higher ceilings sometimes, like this room. We don't know what's going on 20 feet above us. We could be walking down here, it could be 1,000 degrees up there. What tool do we have today to help us figure that out? We got thermal imaging cameras to see convected heat moving around. The point is, is that we need other tools, and it's the last bullet on the slide. We search large area buildings with search ropes, okay? Search ropes is what we use, if you want to go to that bullet. Should be, there you go, use of the search rope. So, Search ropes give us the reference point, but now we're in a large area room like this. If we get caught in a flashover, you gotta remember, I have to know how to follow the search rope out. 
Very difficult task, search rope, using a search rope. It's not an easy deal. You say, yeah, take a search rope into commercial building. Easier said than done. If you haven't drilled on it, you haven't practiced it, it's very difficult to do. Very difficult. So just kind of keep that in mind that it's different for residential buildings versus commercial buildings on how you're going to survive a, a flash rope. We're going to talk about technology a lot today and think about all the technological advances out there in the fire service with regard to our equipment and that, how that helps us make informed decisions on the fire ground. Tom just mentioned the thermal imaging camera. If you were out at the burn with us the other day, Scott's coming out with a new thermal imaging camera. The thing must have been like two pounds. It was really small. The, uh, the, the resolution on the screen was fantastic. It was like two inches by two inches. So it's even getting better for us. So these tools are going to help us make safer operational decisions. We're going to see that convected heat. We're going to have a picture of, of the layout as we go in. Of course, what's the downside to that? You rely on it too much, okay? So just keep that in mind, you know? If you've been around a long time, especially with the older first generation thermal imaging cameras, it was very common to take that thing, go into a room this big and say, oh yeah, look at that, here's this, here's that, I'm going, I'm down the aisle, and about five minutes later the screen would go boop, because the battery was dead. And now you're like, gee, where was that bookcase, and how did I get down here, and, okay? So don't rely on it too much. It doesn't replace our training, it doesn't replace our operational mindset, it's a tool that supplements us. So just don't let it get too far. Any questions on flash over? Any comments? Has anybody in this room been involved or caught in a flash over and got burned terribly? Anybody? Well, that's good. That's a good thing. Okay? I know many firefighters that have been caught in flash overs, and if you all know friends that were or ever been burned, the recovery process is very long, very painful. Uh, so do the best you can. Wear your personal protective equipment. Do some of the things we talked about to prevent flash over and recognize flash overs. So with that, we're going to move into the collapse section and talk about how this is a threat to us. And again, this class is the first 20 minutes, so think about the first 20 operational minutes. All right? Most of the construction today, a lot of it is substandard. Okay? As the economy goes down, the contractors cut corners. They have to save a dollar, too. So it's a threat to us. We talk about sea joists, trust lofts, illegal renovations, non-conforming, etc. Okay? We're going to show you slides in a couple of minutes of a building in uh, 32 Trucks area where I used to work that from the outside appeared to be a perfectly good building, and on the inside it was horrible. We talked about for a long time lightweight wood trusses, okay, and how they impact on us. That's pretty much all that's out there now. All right, what's, uh, we talked about gusset plates back in Vinnie Dunn's day. Uh, what's the new thing now? How do they put the uh, lightweight wood truss together? Glue and little cookies, right, like you make a dresser. Okay, we're going to stand on that thing. It's going to, not, not to even talk about how the heat impacts the glue. Okay, we're going to stand on these things. We're going to operate underneath them. The reason why we review this, this is stuff that you've been listening to and reading about and, and hearing and training for a very long time, if you've been around for a long time. But what's happening, we still have firefighters getting killed and injured in buildings with lightweight construction because they don't recognize the signs and the warnings. However, has anybody been involved in a collapse or seen a collapse at a fire? Okay, what, what could you say about the collapse that struck you? Okay. And uh, I, I was on the line with most of my guys. And you didn't hear it, but uh, the guy in the ground was telling me that the air drum was creaking, they hear some movement in it, and uh, it's all slowed back up. And I think it was about maybe five minutes later, the whole house came to like almost, almost a lean to, but also an inward out. So, so when it happened, how did it happen? Would you say suddenly? Oh, all right. So this young man said that the chief's outside. They recognized some things. They heard some things. They saw some things. They saw some things moving. They recognized some things. But when it happened, we can't predict when it's going to happen. It happens. If we know the warning signs and we're trained to, to learn the warning signs and recognize them, we can help ourselves. And you heard Jay Jonas talk about today in a 110 story building. He got to a point and said, This isn't good. I'm instinct. I'm, I'm, we we got to get out of here. And when it happened, 13 seconds for 110 floors to fall down. So it happens like that. So that's the key. That's the common denominator of a collapse. It happens like that. So even if you recognize the signs, you still may be in trouble. Do you know going into these buildings up front, is that going to impact on your operational decision? Yeah, absolutely it should. If you go in, it's an advanced fire, especially up in the trust. You're not going in there. Not unless you want to have a death wish or really give it a shot. Right? We're not going in there. We're pretty good about that now. We're pretty good about the obvious. All right? We have enough training now where, okay, it's lightweight construction, the trust is involved, we're not going to go in. It's the, it's the not so obvious that we're still not good at. 
Okay, we know there's floor lofts out there, but we're not taking the time to, to know what buildings they're in. We're not taking the time to do that proper size up. So it's not so obvious we have to be worried about. Like Tom said, trust rapid catastrophic failure in, in seconds. 13, 13 seconds for 102 stories. How long do you think it takes for a frame house to come down? Five? Two? It's nothing. This is an older video, but it contains a lot of really good information on lightweight construction, so we like to show Two house fires, reviewing. both in Leesburg, Virginia, but with two very different outcomes. One house burned to the ground, the other didn't. And the reason may have to do with the age of those homes. And Dave Statter explains, in this case, newer isn't always better. This is what firefighters in Leesburg saw when they pulled up on Seton Court this morning. They didn't have a chance to try and save this house. It is believed to have started on the outside and spread up into the attic. Firefighters in Loudoun County and across the country say this is often typical of the fires they see in newer homes built over the last two decades. This is what is considered lightweight construction. Lightweight construction that we're seeing now is, is made of lighter materials. Loudoun Fire Marshal Keith Brower says the lumber supporting the roof and floors in the newer homes are connected with plates that separate quickly in a fire. Uh, the floors collapse, the roofs collapse uh, at a greater speed than in the past. An hour earlier this morning, firefighters were to fire in this Leesburg home two miles away. It is of older construction built in the late 60s or early 70s. While this fire started on the inside, it too spread up into the attic. In older construction, the fire is typically going to stay in the room of origin uh, for a longer amount of time. Firefighters say this is the reality they're dealing with. With the older homes, even with a fire in the attic, they're often able to get inside and stop the fire so there's something to salvage for the homeowner and the house is still standing. But with the newer construction, all bets are off. We used to think uh, that we had anywhere from 8 to 10 minutes that we had a safe margin to go in and begin attacking the fire. But Brower says the fire spread is so fast and the potential for collapse so great in newer homes that firefighters may only get a couple minutes inside to try and stop it spreading before giving up. It also means the people who live there have a shorter time to escape. Uh, radiant heat travels in a straight line. And this morning showed another typical problem. Homes as far away as 150 feet had vinyl siding that began to melt. Brower says a delayed alarm can mean more than one home is burning by the time firefighters get there. Dave Statter, 9 News Now. Home builders have long said that they use those lighter weight materials and construction methods to make houses more economically. In Maryland, some jurisdictions require sprinklers in all new single family homes. That's a battle between home builders and the fire service that is still going on in Virginia and in other states across the country. Why a sprinkle is a battle in the fire service? <laughs> Cost? What's that? Put, well, puts us out of a job, but what do, what do sprinklers do to the contractors? Yeah, there's no money, right? The building doesn't burn down, they don't get to rebuild, okay? If we limit fire spread, we limit damage, they don't get to reconstruct, they don't get to remodel. So that's the argument in the fire service, yes, sir. The fire marshal said they've been talking about the ignorance because a lot of people don't realize how inexpensive they are relative to what they're perceived costs. Absolutely, they believe the, the, the media hype. I mean, really, what does it cost? If you, if you have, a, aside from the fact if you have a well and you need pressure tanks, let's forget about that. You're in a municipality. We have uh, city water. What does it take to put PVC pipe and a couple of sprinkler heads in your house? Right. Particularly nothing. when the building's new. Yeah, when it's new. When it's, it's brand new. It's nothing. So all across the country, there's the debates going on in all these communities. You know, you read one community was successful in getting a sprinkler ordinance, the next community was unsuccessful, and it goes on daily across the country, and it's a shame. It really is a shame. So we talk about consider the obvious now. Commercial buildings, we're very aggressive in commercial buildings, okay? Do you think McDonald's cares if, McDonald's cares if it burns down? No. no, but we're gonna put, I guarantee you, we're gonna put 30 firefighters in there and try to save McDonald's their $2 million restaurant, okay? And that's lightweight construction. That's lightweight truss up there, okay? So again, fact that into your consideration. Some of us like McDonald's. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> so consider, I say, not, consider not only the obvious. What about this building, you pull up, Three in the afternoon, you have smoke coming out, let's say the, uh, the fourth side or the D side, let's say over there, you have smoke coming out the window. Any concerns when you pull up? Anything that like pops out into your mind and says, eh, you know, my electric wire is for laddering, yeah. What's the building made of? Well, what, what does it appear to be made of? Could be newly renovated, could be, but it looks like an ordinary construction, older private dwelling, okay? So it looks pretty, Oh, you know, pretty okay. But then you go inside, okay? Now, here's the front door. 
You walk in the front door and you see this. Now what? It's, no, well, it, it could be a multiple dwelling, but what they did is they renovate, they're renovating the building. So here's, sorry, here's the original, here's the new building. Here's the original building inside. So they bumped out the building. They made it like four feet deeper and like four feet wider. When you go upstairs, they added a floor. That's in the attic. What is that? I don't know if you can see in the back. What is that? That's the roof. The roof line, okay? That's the roof joist going across with the support coming down. What'd they do to the roof joist? They cut them. They, they, they weren't long enough. They didn't have wood that's long enough. So they spliced it together. All right? They spliced it together. So in that structure that's 25 feet wide, they structured that, they split, split that, spliced together that roof joist, and it's got a line in it. What'd they do on the side here? Cut each piece individually. So there's not a solid header going across. It's on that little 16-inch piece of wood. That's where the whole load of the roof is, just sitting on the wood. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. So from the outside, it looks pretty normal. From the inside, it's a disaster. And that's why we say, consider it not so obvious. So how do we find out about buildings like this? All right? Size up. Now, you're going to get, there's going to be a slide in a minute. You're going to see why size up important on the outside. So we'll put that aside for a minute. Fire prevention, okay? You go out, you do an inspection on this building. This is how it was located. They went out for BI. They found it, okay? <coughs> how, many, how many of you <coughs> on the career side, guys that are career firefighters, how many of you do building inspection in your areas? A few. How many in the volunteer side do inspections? Oh, there's a couple, actually. I'm surprised. Usually, it's the local building department, local fire marshals that do inspections, all right? So on the volunteer side, sometimes we're at a disadvantage unless we have a really good relationship with those folks and we get the information that we need. Obviously, a building like that, we would want to know about. What's a critical information file? Critical information file is something you put in your office on your apparatus where you discover that something that's bad for firefighters is going to impact on your operation. You put a card in a file. You put a note somewhere. So you get the address, you look quickly in the card file, you see if anything's on file for that address. How do you discover this? BI, you know, going out on inspection. What if you don't do that? Your department doesn't do it. Well, do you have a relationship with the building inspector or the code enforcement personnel in town? Go find out what's going on in town. Meet with them once a week or once every two weeks. See what's going on. What kind of construction? What are they putting up? Is there anything dangerous to us? Make a note on it. Put in your critical information Those file. of you that have computer-aided dispatch, do you have a method to get information on dangerous buildings and put it into the computer-aided computer dispatch system so that when address comes up and it gets sent out to the units, it comes up on the, on the uh, mobile data terminal if you have those in your apparatus, and you get the information. How many of you have that kind of system? A lot. That's good. Okay? The, the more of you that have that, the better off the firefighters are, the safe the firefighters are. Here's the problem with those types of systems. Those, I, I try to give both sides. And what we find in New York, we have something called SIDS, Critical Information Dispatch System. Now it's all electronic. It's on a computer. The company officer in a particular area can go on a computer, fill out a SIDS card or a SIDS information uh, screen, and it goes to the battalion chief who approves it or disapproves it, goes to the deputy chief who approves it or disapproves it, then it goes into the system. Very quick, very quick. The problem is, is that sometimes it's not up to date. It does, we don't keep up to date with it. And I'll give you an example. I had a fire in a building that was new, newly constructed. It was a school. But when the school was still under disrepair, there was information in the file that there was temporary shoring in the basement of this particular building. And one night, I get a fire in the building. It's new. It's open, brand new, sprinklers, the whole deal. We get a fire in the kitchen downstairs, and the sprinklers are controlling the fire. Pretty good smoke condition, however. To make a long story short, the deputy chief was coming into the fire, and I was standing in front of the building. The guys had a line into the sprinkler system. We had the fire under control. Everything was good. And this chief, who had like 35 years in the job, he's running down the block, running. And he's got the, uh, the, the response ticket in his hand, and he's running. He's, Tom, 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 did you, see the, did you see the SIDS on the building? Get the guys out of there. I said, Chief, it's old. It's old. I said, it's a brand new building. We didn't keep the information up to date. We never changed the information. So. We, he was being safe. He knew what he was doing. That's what he had. I had it on my ticket, but it's in my response area. I knew the building was new when I pulled up. I said, oh, this building is new. This is information is bad. I knew it right away. Okay, but 
try and keep up on the information as best you can. Once we discover the information today, again, technology, we have digital recorders, we have digital cameras, we have all sorts of ways to document the, the information, bring it back to your department meeting, to your drill, and put it out there for everybody to see. We don't have to bring everybody to the building anymore. That's nice, but we don't have time to do that sometimes. Everybody's working, et cetera. They have, t they have trouble getting time aside. Bring it to your department meetings. Put it out there for everybody to see. So we talked about this building again, on-site uh, on size up. When you, when you look at this fence, when you come in, something you would have blew right past, okay, there's a couple of things on the fence. One is a work permit saying that they're going to do a renovation. They're going to add a second story. They're going to make the building bigger. And right next to the work permit, is to stop work order for the illegal construction, okay? <laughs> so a building inspector was there, but again, two things come out of this. One, we don't have a relationship with our building inspectors because, of course, it's the city of New York and we don't talk to each other. So the building inspector puts the stop work order in, says it's bad for us, but we don't know about it. Now, that's changed in the last, like, six months. Now we get a notification, so that's been rectified. What are the firefighters going to do? If there's smoke or fire coming in that building, what are we doing when we get there? We're ripping that right plywood there. off, and it's going to be face down on the sidewalk, and everybody's running in the building. So, In the Bronx, two firefighters can rip it down. In Brooklyn, it's like six or eight. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, All right. Any questions on collapse? We just went through collapse quickly, okay? Uh, we're going to move into communications. Now, communications. We could probably sit here and debate. One thing we'd all agree on is it's, a, it's everybody should have a radio. Okay, it's a great thing in a fire service, everybody has a radio now. Then we could debate on whether it's good that everybody has a radio. And we would say yes, but then what's the downfall? Everybody wants to talk on a radio, <laughs> okay? We had our drill yesterday, and one of the things that one of the students said, and we talked about this for a long time, and we still haven't done it, there's no class that reviews radio discipline with firefighters. Here, that's it. We don't say what you should say, how you should say it, when you should say it, what you shouldn't say. Hello. <coughs> we really need to work on radio discipline. Is it a good thing? Well, first we have to turn it on. Not everybody turns it on. In the heat of the moment, they slap it on, they throw their turnout coat on, and you know all gear now. Once you get all that stuff on to get in there and turn the radio on, it's a pain. All right? So that's one thing. Turn it on. Be connected with the situation. Think of when you first came into the fire service and you got the radio for the first time. A lot of information came over the radio. Did you hear anything of it? Usually not, because you're just your eyes are this big and you're just focusing on what you're doing. As you get experience and time in, in the service, you start to listen to what's on the radio. You start to become connected. You hear the officer call for water. You hear the chief giving his orders from the outside. You're listening to what's going on around you. So you become connected with the situation. Listen to what's going on. Not only around you exterior, and what I mean is you're on a floor above the fire, you know, listen to the water hitting the ceiling, feel it, you know what's going on below. But listen to the situation. Listen to the roof person saying the roof is open. Listen to whoever you have outside. We have water problems. Listen to what's going on. Focus on the assigned task. Don't let the listening impact on what you're doing. Okay? It can supplement what you're doing and aid in your decision-making process. But what we mean by focus on the assigned task, if you're in the middle of doing something and you hear a May Day over there, we're not going to go this way. We still have our assigned tasks to do. We still have our responsibilities. We have to keep on track because the radio can distract us from our task at hand. And it's not your personal cell phone. Don't call your buddy. Don't call for Gatorade in the middle of the fire operation. And unfortunately for the younger firefighters, you can't text on it. But I'm sure in a few years we'll fix that. It'll be a slide. You'll be able to text on it. Okay, but it's a tool and it's an important tool. One of the things we like to key on is report assignments not completed. That's one of the most important features of the radio that we're getting away from. If you're a roof firefighter and you're assigned to open the roof and you can't open the roof, not being able to accomplish that task is more important to the incident commander than him hearing the roof's open. Things you can't do. I couldn't complete the search. I can't get water. The hydrant's bad. Things to prevent you from doing your task correctly and completely. Let's talk about radio. Do we do, I'm going to ask you the question, be honest. Do we do a good job as a fire service in our own departments simply teaching young, new firefighters how to talk on a radio? Do we drill on it? No. We give them the radio. There you go. Knock yourself out. Right? 
And so we don't really do a good job of that. That's something that you need to think about. We need to train our firefighters how to talk on the radio. Short, concise reports. Short, concise reports. So that's one thing we don't do well. How many of you have radios that have the capability of transmitting an emergency alert tone? A lot of you, that's good. Okay, that's a new technology. It's been out a little while. Did anybody sit in on Chief Rainus's presentation this morning? Okay, well, in the safety video at the opening ceremony, they talked about something called EFIS, Emergency Electronic Fireground Accountability System. In New York now, we've always, we've had the uh, emergency alert buttons for a while, but now it's connected to this emergency fireground accountability system where we can actually identify firefighters on a computer screen out in the chief's car if they hit their emergency alert button. They show up in the screen in red, and it doesn't go away until you, until you clear the May Day, okay? Guy hits his button, here's the May Day, he shows up on the screen. It's a great technology. You know, we're still working through it. They just recently installed it in all battalion and deputy chief's vehicles in New York City, and we have the technology. Great tool, great tool. But if you don't have it, it's something that you need to look into. I realize budgets are concerned in many places, so it's probably not feasible in many areas. However, it's a good technology to have. What ties into that technology, too, is, uh, you know, back in 2001, we had manual writing lists for who was working, right? You filled it out on a piece of paper, you, you know, you went onto the apparatus, you put it on the paper, you know, on the clipping end, and that, that's who was working to the day. So what normally happened? You got in the apparatus, it was three days old, there was a stack of them this high for the last month and a half, okay? Now we have electronic writing lists. You go in in the morning, you log on, and you fill out the writing list electronically on who's working that day. That ties together with EFAS. How does it tie together? When it says uh, Battalion 3A, Chief of the Day, well, Tommy told it in the morning he was the Chief of the Day. So when he clicks his radio, not only his position comes up, but his name comes up. So it all ties together. It's a great system. And that's how we're moving in a fire service, which is tremendous. Because one of the things that happened in 2001 is we had no idea who was there. You know, 11 people got on a rig. The day tour, the night tour, we had no accountability. And this is another tool in a fire service that make us have accountability. Okay, the next couple of slides now. <clears throat> we're going to show you a couple of pictures. And while you're watching the pictures or looking at the pictures, we're going to play an audio. We're going to play an audio of a firefighter giving a May Day. There's going to be some transmissions prior to the May Day, and then there'll be transmissions after the May Day. And let's just to set it up, this was a fire in a two-story private dwelling. It was at 7 o'clock at night on a Tuesday night. A serious fire on arrival, several firefighters in the building, and things we started to lose. We were losing. We were losing. So you'll listen to some of the transmissions. You'll hear the May Day in the middle of those transmissions. So listen to it and let us know what you think after we watch it. So on arrival, this was what we had on arrival. This was the back of the house. The house was, the whole back of the house was on fire. Fire had extended into the first floor a little bit, window frame in the basement at first, and it got up into the soffit and into the attic space, and the entire attic was on fire. So we deployed hose lines. We got lines on every floor, uh, and we thought we were doing good, and then it kind of changed. So listen to the audio as we move through. Well, I need everybody out of the 
second floor now. And all units, urgent. All units. Everybody out of the building. Come down off the second floor right now. 31 command, you get that? Everybody down out of the building off the first and second floor. Everybody out right now. What did you hear? A lot of confusion about what? Okay. Have you ever been in a fire where the incident commander made a decision to evacuate the building and the incident commander has to repeatedly tell the firefighters, evacuate the building, evacuate the building, evacuate the building? Have you heard that happen? Who has? Well, I'll be the first to tell you in New York City it happens a lot. <laughs> we'll be standing out. It takes a long time to get guys out. It doesn't happen like that. It takes time to get people out of the building. So just be aware of that. You, know, you say it, you may give the order, but it takes time. We have hose lines in there. We have guys crawling around. Uh, at this particular fire, we had hose lines on every floor. We lost. We, we wound up losing, okay? And we lost terribly. And we almost lost a couple of firefighters, okay? We had firefighters coming down on ladders. We had firefighters coming down the stairs. Um, and the person that gave the May Day on the second floor he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to make sure everybody else was out. And in the process, got turned around. However, what was the lesson there? What do you think is a good lesson there about May, giving a May Day? If you think you're in trouble, give the May Day. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. This is an experienced firefighter, been around a long time. He's an excellent firefighter. And he talked about this after the fire in a critique and said, hey, man, I thought I was in trouble, I gave the May Day. And he did the right thing. And he was able to come out, we got him out safely, thankfully, and we were able to account for everybody. If you listen to more of it, we listen to more of it, we next do a roll call, or an accountability, a PAR, as many of you call it, all right, to make sure that we had everybody. Now, how many of you out there in the volunteer world uh, would say that you do 100% positively, you have your accountability down Hard and fast, done. Everybody's got their tags. The safety officer has the tags, and then when something happens, we can figure that all out. Anybody, anybody here willing to say that's perfect? I doubt it, okay? So let me say this. Work on your accountability protocols. Work on your roll calls. Practice doing a roll call, a par. Practice it. If you don't practice it, you're not gonna be good at it when the real deal happens. In New York City now, we have a policy. Every three months, at a fire, doesn't have to be a bad fire, they want the incident commander to practice what we call a roll call. That's our part. We practice it so that when we do have the real deal, we're going to be good at it. So try to practice your roll calls. Okay? So 
be willing to give the May Day if you're in trouble. Understand that it's not going to happen overnight when you try to evacuate people from a building. It doesn't happen quickly. But you have to be steadfast and you have to make sure, and then you got to make sure everybody got out. Mutual aid departments. Mutual aid departments come to your fires. Is that a problem sometimes with accountability? So at this particular fire, the incident commander says to the, the chief of the mutual aid department, you got all your guys? He says, yeah. The incident commander wasn't really sure. He's going with his word, saying, I guess everybody's out. Like, they gave their tags and all of that stuff, but we weren't 100% sure. Okay, so this was a, a, a I'm not going to call it a routine fire. It was an advanced fire on arrival. It almost turned terribly bad. So how are we going to manage a May Day? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Before we touch on that, we talk about maintaining operational discipline, you know, keep focused on what you're doing. You know, the May Day is one thing. That's for the incident commander and the, and the FAST of the RIT team. The firefighters have to focus on a task at hand. But I want to touch on how does, because uh, you guys disagreed about getting out of the building. You don't have any problem getting firefighters out of the building? It wasn't that. It was, you say you got a handwriting strike. You don't have to repeat an order 20 times. Not, not three okay. times. Three well, it, it takes time that they follow the order. What are, what are, department makes a difference. No, absolutely. Right. Well, what's our, what are our operational impediments? We talk about instinct and spidey sense. What are operational impediments to withdrawing from a building in the fire service? Yeah, give me another, I got it. I, I, Chief, I got it. I'm right here. I got it. Give me another two minutes. It's over. I got it. it. That's the first thing. The second thing is in the fire service, we don't like to lose. And withdrawing from a building is starting over, resetting, it's losing. We don't like to do that. So those are our psychological impediments to getting people out. And then, of course, in our world, I have 50 to 200 firefighters that I have to remove. And then, you know, between the operation or the mindset impediments and they're not coming out and getting them out, it takes probably the better part of 15 minutes to evacuate a building. So now put that into your head with collapses and how long we think it, it takes a while. It takes a while. So we're going to talk about a study that was done in Savannah, Georgia. It's four slides. Before we get to that. Sorry. Before we get to that. Just quickly. How do you manage a May Day? We got to talk about managing May Day. Guy gave May Day. How do we manage it? Okay. Can you, if those of you that are incident commanders, can the incident commander manage a May Day the same time he's managing the fire? Not happening. I'm going to tell you from experience. Not happening. Rich and I have been chiefs 11 years in New York. I've been a chief in volunteers twice. It's not happening. You have to delegate it or delegate the fire. One or the other. Somebody's got to take charge of the May Day. You've got to manage the May Day. What's, other, what's another important point relative to the fire operation? Guy gave May Day. What's the natural tendency for most firefighters when they hear a May Day? Everybody wants to run in and help the guy or gal. Whoever's in trouble. Okay, they're going. We're getting this guy. You've got to have maintain operational discipline. We have to stay focused. We have to put the fire out. If we put the fire out, we are actually helping the person or the people that are in trouble. You got to continue operating, putting the fire out. You got to get control of the radio. You got to get control of the radio. Everybody stay off the radio until we clear this May Day, unless it's an urgent situation. We have fire problem that's going to impact on our May Day situation. Okay? So, how about the rapid intervention team? The natural tendency for most incident commanders, they hear a May Day, rapid intervention team is standing here, all good, ready to go. Rapid intervention team wants to run in the building. The chief wants to launch them. You ever see that? The Staples commercial, I got the red button, you know, you bang the red. That's what the chiefs want to do with the rapid intervention team sometimes. Just launch the rapid intervention team without having any information. We have to gather information for a couple of minutes so we can give it to the rapid intervention team. Hey, listen. So-and-so gave the May Day. We know who it is. This is where they were last seen. This is who it is. This is the information. Uh, and, and these are the conditions. All right, now go. And now go and do your plan, okay? So don't launch the rapid intervention team. And get the information first, okay? So managing the May Day is critical. Think about your normal span of control. It's five to one, right? In the chief, you got maybe 20, 30 companies there. Then you have the May Day come in, all right? You have to get it off your plate. There's only so much on your hard drive you can operate with. You have to get another chief officer or a senior company officer, take either the May Day or the fire off the plate, like Tommy said. You have to delegate it. Before we get into this next little thing, how many of you are aware of the program that was put out, rolled out by the IAFF, International Association of Firefighters, called the Fireground Survival Program? Anybody aware of it? 
Has anybody sat through it or taken it? Okay, it's available. They started developing this program back in 2007 and they kind of rolled it out last year, 2000. It's been out about a year now. It's, it's a tremendous program. It covers several things relative to fire ground survival. Just to give you a few of them. Preventing the May Day. I think that's most important. First thing I want to know is teach my guys how to not be in a May Day situation, right? Being ready for the May Day. Are you ready for the May Day? That's what we're going to talk about in a minute. Self-survival procedures, self-survival skills, firefighter expectations of command, and how to survive the May Day and how to lead the rescue. It's a great program. If you go on the IAFF website, it's very comprehensive. It's very lengthy. It's long. There's various components to it. There's several modules, uh, but it's really an excellent program. If you have the opportunity to get on our website and take a look at it, it would be worth your while. And part of that program, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of slides. Rich is going to introduce it to you. Are you ready for the May Day? That's what we're going to talk about. So one department, Savannah, down south, took it the next step. Okay, we did all this training. We educated our firefighters. Let's see if we're ready for the May Day. So how, how do you figure out if you're ready? What they did is they gave them a statement, okay? They, they put a statement out there. They said, if you train and you know how your firefighter is going to react under pressure, then you'll know how to rescue them. That was their philosophy. That's how they trained. So they took 160 firefighters and they simulated a May Day in a shopping mall, okay? It was a shopping mall center with a May Day. And this is what the firefighters were told. 160 firefighters were told this statement up there. You're a crew, you're stretching an inch and three quarter hand line into a structure. When you encounter cold smoke and zero visibility. Now, get into your first 20 minute mode now. You're encountering cold smoke and zero visibility. While maintaining voice contact with your crew, this is the company officer, you begin searching for the fire. Suddenly, you don't know, no longer have voice contact with your crew, and you become lost and disoriented. This is not a training scenario. Your life depends on your action. So this is what they gave to the participants. Here's some of the results. I don't know if you've seen this. this was some, there's some really notable or telling results here about what firefighters did when they became lost and disoriented. What did they do? Only half of them, 52%, Attempted radio contact. They all had radio. Only had. Only 38% of them activated their pass alarms. Aren't we taught in basic fire school, basic firefighter one, if you're in trouble and you get lost and you're down, activate your pass alarm. We get taught that? Okay. Most of them were searching for a way out, which is normal. That, that's a good thing. Everybody was searching for a way out. One telling point on this slide Follow, they were on a hose line. It said, right, the scenario was you stretch an inch and three quarter line into the building. You're on a crew. You're on the hose line. Nine percent of the guys tried to follow the hose line out of 160 guys. Only nine percent. Aren't we taught that in basic firefighting? Follow the hose line out. If you can find the hose line, the bumps to the pumps, that whole deal, right? That was telling. And then the emergency activation on their radio, only four percent of them chose to activate the emergency alert button, okay? And here's the, here's the real bad story. Out of 160 firefighters in this study, less than 4%, less than 4% of the firefighters get out of the building safely. So you know what this says? This says that our culture, we are not, we haven't gotten there yet. We're all big, tough folks. We're all class A personalities, type A personalities. We want to be hard charges. I'm not in trouble. I'll get out of this. I'll get out of this. Well, this study proved in this particular department that they need to do some more training. And I think, it's, I think this is indicative of what's going on in the fire service today. We talk about it. We talk about it. We do a lot of talking. But we don't do. So this study was, uh, was, was actually an eye-opener for me when I, when I took a look at it. And it's part of the Fire Ground Survival Program. This is, comes out of one of the modules. So the next slide kind of said, says it all, okay? Why are you listening to him? You're alone and in trouble. Call the freaking May Day. That's, that's the good guy. And the devil's saying, don't be a weenie. You can get out of this, <laughs> all right? So that's what happens. That's the real world. That's what's happening, okay? So go back to your firehouses, talk to your fire folks, talk to your firefighters, and say, we gotta practice this stuff if we're gonna survive, if we're gonna survive. Are you ready for the May Day? Are you ready for it? Have you done the training or are you going to do the training? We inserted this last night and that hose line statistic is mind boggling to me. 165 fighters, 9% is 14. 
14 followed the hose line, or attempted to follow the hand line out. And I don't know where we've gone wrong with that, but I don't know, when I came on, it's all they talked about was which way the butts are facing, follow the line, follow the line, follow the line, and we dropped the ball somewhere. 14 firefighters out of 160. So again, just to wrap it up, operational progress. We're talking about the interior fire spread, the hazards, the exposures, and the collapse potential. Okay, all these have to be monitored to figure out if you're winning the war, if you're getting to where you want to be. <clears throat> to wrap up the program, be familiar with the common early operational pitfalls we talked about today. That's not to say that there's others aren't going to come in there. These are the three most common. These are the things that, that happen every day. These are the things we talk about. Be familiar with them. Have knowledge of your crew, your personnel, and your equipment, okay? It all ties into how we're going to operate, and it's going to tie into your decision-making process. If you go to Tom Dunn's class a couple down, he talks about his size up as a deputy chief, as the senior incident commander for us. First thing he does, he takes out the chief officer's sheet. We have a sheet because there's so many of us that so we don't know what to do with them all. all right, there's 50 battalions. He looks at the chiefs that are working in his division, and he said it impacts on his decision-making process. He said, if I see a chief that's been around a long time, that I'm very comfortable with, that's really good with his operational technique, he said, I'm, I'm comfortable. I, you know, I, I, I'm comfortable when I'm on the way. If I see a chief I don't know, brand new battalion chief, I don't know his history, I don't know where he was, he said, I'm a little uncomfortable. It impacts on his operational decision making. So knowledge of your personnel. An aggressive fire attack, like Sam said early on, water. 85 to 90 percent of your problems go away. Andy Frederick used to say, if you put water on a fire, you don't have to jump out the window. Right? If you take care of the fire, most of your problems go away. We talked about comfort zone. That's a big key for me and Tom. Don't let anybody push you out of your comfort zone. If it doesn't look right, if it doesn't smell right, it's not right. Get the information to you, that you need to make a comfortable, well-informed decision. Put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Sometimes we don't have all the pieces. Would you agree? We make decisions on the fire ground many, many times with incomplete pieces of the puzzle. Yes or no? But well, we have to rely on our instinct, we have to rely on our training, we have to rely on information and what we're seeing, information we're receiving. Sometimes we don't have it all. But we do make those decisions sometimes based on incomplete information. Just be aware of that. We don't always have all the answers. But we have to move forward and then make decisions and do it in a safe manner. Training is key, especially when you have a tough start. Okay? <laughs> Nobody ever does that. <laughs> Nobody ever does that. All right, so keep on track. All right, when things are difficult, the training is always going to pull you through. Remember, our primary mission is the protection of life and property as firefighters, okay? We go out the door safe and together. We come back safe and together. Use the tools we have to prevent the obvious, the thermal imaging cameras, okay, the bunker gear, the PPE. Use the things we have to keep us safe. Do you do scenario-based training in your departments, whether it be hands-on or classroom? Do you put people in tough situations? Do you put them in stressful situations like Savannah did with their firefighters to learn something? They did a study. Put your people in stressful situations. Do scenarios. Talk about scenarios. Make them stress out so that they learn something from the, from the uh, exercise. You got to be, there's a balance though. You don't want to stress them out so long so that they, they zone out and they don't take anything away. But do scenario based training. There's several computer computer based programs out there to build fires and take pictures of buildings in your district and build fires and do scenarios but do it with radio communication put guys in tough situations and and make them make decisions okay if you come to our, if you came to our live burn class if you come next year you know the goal of that class is we put you in a stressful situation in that burn building we give you a May Day, we tell you you lost a firefighter we put you through a wall breach that's all to put you in a stressful a stressful situation in training scenarios so when you get it out there in the real world, you're prepared for it. You did it before. Any pra questions? Practice the way you play. Sorry, one more I'm statement. Sorry. Practice the way you play. What that means is don't do a BS drill. When you go do a drill, do the drill. Set realistic parameters. Make it a real serious drill. Play later. Don't fluff off on the drills. Don't go to the same high school, the same water treatment plant over and over and over again where the personnel just sit there and fluff off, okay? Do serious drills. You practice seriously, you play seriously, everybody stays safe. We just had this discussion recently at a conference that a bunch of chief officers in my uh, division, the deputy chief said to us all, hey, listen, when you guys have multi-unit drill, on Saturdays and Sundays we have what we call multi-unit drill. We get two or three units together and we do a drill at a particular location. And typically what happens is many of the companies come, 
guys still just start talking. We have certain policies that we do. We check all the breathing apparatus again, and we check the area a lot to make sure it works. But the chief talked about the fact that we become complacent many times, and the guys come there and all they do is chat, talk about the news, talk about sports, and we're not doing meaningful drills. So when you have those opportunities to do meaningful drills, particularly in the volunteer system, the volunteer system, people's time is at a premium. Would you agree? So now when people come down for training in the volunteers, you've got to make it meaningful. You've got to give them an hour drill. They take something home from the drill. They could go home to their families and be available to respond. If we don't do that, if we keep people in the firehouse two, three, four hours doing a drill, you lose them. Make it meaningful, okay? Put a plan together. Have some kind of sequential training program so that you can, you can do that and make it meaningful for all of them. On the career side, company offices many times are not good at giving drills. But we have more tools at our disposal today with computers and such that we can give really good drills, even taking an article out of a magazine, make a bunch of copies, sit at the table, help the guys read it, and then discuss it. Little things like that are meaningful. Make it meaningful for your particular district, your particular response area. We appreciate you coming today. Thanks very much. Thanks for hanging out. We're sorry the uh, opening ceremony went late.